Hello, it's The Rep and it's a new year. This is Felix, back to bring you the 7th installment of Rugby's Economic Podcast. Since last year, makes us sound old now, right? This is the show that has looked at how money, power and politics have driven the game of rugby to the edges of financial ruin and back again. But seriously, it's a new year for us at The Rep and that will mean a couple of changes as we move into Season 2. But for the rest of Season 1... We're going to keep doing what we do best and let's have a chat about some of the things that are happening off the pitch which affect our enjoyment of the rugby on it. Typically that means I drag you down the rabbit hole and discuss tangential topics like the role private equity plays in sport as we did before we all engorged ourselves on the Christmas feast. But this year we're all about relevance and it's time we really discuss what makes the on-field game tick. It's the laws. Today we're flirting with the offside line as we open the law book and try to understand how the rules, I know rugby doesn't have rules, of the game have changed, and if they've produced a better game for us all. So settle in with the last of the turkey sandwiches, because this one's going to be controversial. One of rugby's most peculiar quirks is the fact that it has laws, not rules. This makes absolutely no difference to the modern fan, but for us alakadoos and anoraks, it is the essence of what makes rugby rugby. In episode 1 we talked about how the game was developed by the upper classes and it is here where the term laws were coined instead of rules. In fact even soccer's governing body the football association had called their rules laws in the beginning. Many of those involved in the formation of the game were solicitors or barristers by trade so it's obvious enough how it all came about. This has left us with the tradition of calling them laws, a tradition that has been held onto by the shackles of amateurism throughout the 20th century. Far from being one of the tops, I do enjoy calling them laws. By their nature, rules are objective and leave no room for ambiguity, whereas laws are a bit more subjective and open to interpretation. This creates tense and controversial moments week in, week out, across the sport, ensuring that the rugby public have plenty to debate and argue over each week, and it does add to the excitement of games despite dividing much opinion. To be fair, I don't know any sport which doesn't have its fair share of controversial decisions, but I guess rugby probably has the most. So the subjective nature of rugby's laws creates a certain ambiguity which fuels the adage that rugby is a complex sport. Well, it is and it isn't, if I can be so Irish to say. Sure, it takes many newcomers to the game a little while to catch up, but like all things in life, the best things come to those who wait. I guess I'm a romantic who thinks of rugby like a game of chess, fought between two generals on a battlefield, each moving their battalions ever closer to the opponent's territory until they can strike, and it really can be that strategic. Sometimes you can rain down bombs of kicks onto your opponent until they capitulate and you can take advantage, or else you go full noise and lay siege through the battering rams that exist in your pack. Yes, there are many ways to skin the rugby cat, and that's what makes it great. But over the years, rugby's changed, and mostly for the better. Watching a game today versus one from just 20 years ago is almost unrecognisable, and these changes have been brought about by slight and severe alterations to the laws, and in some cases the introduction of new laws altogether. There are three or so reasons for the law changes as far as I can tell, and these fall under the categories of safety, entertainment and fairness. Let's take a look at each of them and what they've done to improve or not our game. As former Springbok coach Heineken Mayer once said, ballroom dancing is a contact sport, rugby is a collision sport. And as such, safety seems as good a place as any to start with the law changes. In fact, if you remember back to our very first episode of The Rep, we talked about how the rules of football are what split the sport and created soccer and rugby in the first place. One of the contentious rules at the time was the ability to hack fellow players, which was one of the defining characteristics of the early game of rugby. For those who haven't played, hacking is where you basically trip an opposing player by kicking their legs, specifically their shins. Despite its insistence in the beginning, Blackheat and Richmond abolished hacking by 1866 and when the RFU was formed in 1871, there was no mention of it in the official laws. But some clubs refused to remove the tactic from their games, and as a result they couldn't join the RFU. Funnily enough, one of these clubs was Rugby School, where the game was invented, go figure. They eventually removed its use and joined the RFU by 1890. Needless to say, I think we can all agree that removing hacking was a decent move, 
one that many of us modern players be glad of. Then there's the scrum, probably the most contentious area of rugby by the refereeing itself. Once an all-out melee organised quickly and with reckless abandon, the scrum is the perfect competition to restart play whilst occupying over half the players on the pitch, creating space for an attacking team. However, the idea of 8 100 plus kilo monsters crashing into another 8 monsters isn't exactly the best advertisement for player welfare. I mean, we've all loved King Kong vs Godzilla, but you'd have to agree nobody's volunteering to play the insurance company executive in those movies. Over the years, particularly since professionalism, the scrum has been gradually slowed down to reduce the hit, as they call it. First we had the process of crouch, touch, pause, engage, which is probably worse than the scrum that preceded it. I mean the pause before the hit was more like cranking back a spring only to be released at the call of engage. Ouch. But thanks to the many necklace hookers that emerged at the time, World Rugby saw fit to adjust the scrum calls again, this time ensuring the bind pre-contest. This does take the sting out of the hit but has the unfortunate result of many collapsed scrums as props scrummage too low leaving their legs too far back to support their own weight. So slightly safer scrums are a big positive but that has come at the expense of repeated collapses, meaning lengthy resets and a lot of pissed off fans at home and in the stands. I mean, one scrum can take the guts of three or five minutes from the moment it's called until the ball gets put in, never mind having to reset one or more times. This is sucking the entertainment value out of the sport and allows teams to run down the clock as there are no time stoppages usually for reset scrums, reducing the ball in playtime. The obvious solution would be to stop the clock during scrums, from when the scrum is awarded until the ball is out again, but that causes more problems. One, it doesn't solve the issue for fans watching, especially those of us who brave the cold stadiums in wet winter when handling errors and scrums are more likely. And two, it means front rowers, especially props, would be expected to scrummage full noise and play 80 or so minutes around the park. Here's another contentious law change actually. Roughly 10 or so years ago, World Rugby changed the number of substitutes a team needs to have increasing from 7 to 8, with each team required to have a replacement for each of the front row positions. Again, with safety in mind, this is a few unintended consequences on the entertainment factor of the game. Sure, we get to see more players, but the excitement in the last quarter of the game is almost the same as the first 20 minutes. Teams can essentially replace half their players, meaning that the regular fatigue that would set in around the end of the game is no longer there. Now why is that a bad thing, you ask? Because nobody makes mistakes. Tired and fatiguing players make defensive mistakes or can't quite keep the pace, resulting in mismatches and entertaining tries. Come on, preseason used to be about creating season-lasting stamina, which would be tested in those dying minutes of knockout games. Nowadays, preseason's just shit training without games. I'm all for the safety of the game, but let's not bludgeon our sport down to a blunt nib. Perhaps having the eight subs, but coaches only allowed to use five of them, might be a solution which allows us to keep some of that fabulous fatigue. There's some food for thought, eh? Speaking of thought, we can't talk about safety laws without talking about rugby's existential threat, head injury. The nature of the game is such that you have monsters running at other monsters at pace. Inevitably, this is going to lead to injury. I don't confess to any medical training as such, so I won't argue for or against the laws which currently exist, but I will share my opinion. With the tackle height being lowered to below the shoulders, meaning you can only tackle a man beneath, You end up forcing defending players to contort themselves in an attempt to tackle low and ultimately bring defenders' heads directly into contact with rock-solid knees. Certainly saves one head in that scenario, but not both. I think most people accept that there's an element of risk for everyone who walks onto a rugby paddock, but what people don't accept is the vast variation of interpretations that exist, especially in this area of head injury prevention. We're all very familiar with the variations that exist between how the Southern Hemisphere interpret the breakdown versus us up here in the North. But on a topic of such importance, with such a profound impact on the future of any given match, I for one would welcome some objectivity. Think about the subjective idea of mitigation. This can be one of a number of factors which can reduce a red card to a yellow card or even a penalty, each of which has a significant impact on the remainder of that game. Let's imagine Ireland are playing England and the Irish centre Robbie Henshaw is tackling English centre Henry Slade. You could argue that this is a like-for-like matchup, with each of them roughly weighing about 95 kilos and standing about 6 foot 1. So Robbie, the fierce competitor that he is, puts in a tackle and catches Slade around the neck. Slade was mid-run, struggling with his balance, so was slightly lowered as Robbie made contact. 
This is a red card by the laws, but is reduced to yellow as Slade's body height is lowered. A let off for the Irish, but still 10 minutes down to 14 men as a result. Now imagine the All Blacks are playing the Springboks, and in similar fashion, 6 foot 7, 120 kilo New Zealand lock Brody Retallick tackling Springbok speedster Cheslin Colby of 5 foot 7 and 75 kilos. This time Colby's low sensor of gravity sees him stable, but Retallick still makes the same tackle that Robbie had made on Slade. Retallick catches Colby in the head, and as such is red carded. Same offence, different sanction. The All Blacks lose Retallick for the rest of the game, reducing the power of their line-out and removing their scrum from the equation completely. It's hard to feel for the All Blacks, but the objective fan here can say that they've been hard done by. Heaven knows there's always an excuse when they're beaten, without World Rugby supplying them with ready-made ones. Sometimes World Rugby do get it right though. Not often, but sometimes. And the recent introduction of the 50-22 kick is a great example of same. Since the summer we've been treated to a new dimension to the kicking game, one that's not just territorial brinkmanship or defensive roulette vis-a-vis the box kick. With the introduction of this law change, now when a team kicks from within their half of the pitch and it goes out in the opposition 22 area of the pitch, bouncing in field first of course, then the kicking team will be awarded the throw-in at the line-out. This is an excellent addition to rugby for a number of reasons. Firstly, it appreciates the skill it takes to kick a rugby ball in a certain way to produce a very specific result, like bouncing it in a very particular way. Secondly, it means that the defending team can no longer ignore the backfield and set up 14-man defensive walls, which are nigh impossible to break down. This is a particular bugbearer of mine. Sure, the rush defence is a thing of beauty when executed well, but there are only so many one-metre phases of play a man can sit through. I, for one, are glad of this change, meaning that teams now must devote two players into defending the backfield. This creates the most wonderful thing, space. Not quite the final frontier, it's actually the first frontier. Rugby has always been about finding space and running into it. This new law change enables more of that, and I think it should be applauded. An A1 example of law changes for entertainment purposes. The next change made this year for entertainment purposes, although World Rugby might say it's safety related as well, is the flying wedge. This one may have flown under the radar for a lot of fans, but it has changed the game a lot this year. Remember all those times you'd see back rowers share a warm embrace as they drove a prop over the line for a try? Almost impossible to defend. Well yeah, that's gone, along with the one man latch pre-contact. The point here is to stop sealing off, where the second man, or woman, is frequently off their feet when the contact comes and basically seals off the ball from the defensive team. These changes to the contact area have served to create a better contest where there's contact, and also to incentivize moving the ball quickly from the breakdown area. Andy Dunn made a good point recently talking about the breakdown. Only in rugby circles is the breakdown considered a good thing. But why is that? Surely it's a breakdown in play which should be considered a bad thing, no? I'm no rugby league convert before you think otherwise, and I certainly enjoy the war of attrition at ruck time, but he's not wrong, you know? Anyway, something to think about as we discuss the third category of reasons behind law changes, and this is fairness. Here the main changes to the laws have come from the introduction of technology in the form of the television match official, or TMO. The TMO first hit mainstream rugby in 2001 after undergoing trials in the Southern Hemisphere in the late 1990s. For those who don't know, the TMO is a fourth refereeing official who's located in some media truck or box in the stadium, watching the game on a slight delay using a system called Hawkeye. On the system, the TMO is seeing the game from multiple angles and has the ability to pause, slow down and re-watch things that happen in the game. Specifically, they are looking out for foul play and confirming scores. In recent years, World Rugby have sought to improve the game by leaving decision-making power solely in the hands of referees, albeit with the ability to consult the touch judges and TMOs. And it's this consultation which has taken so much from rugby. There are just too many decisions being referred to the TMO, as referees are almost paralysed to make their own decisions. With the global social media jury waiting for someone to trip up, the fear of being wrong is so high. The problem this creates are twofold. First, it slows down the process of actually playing a bit of footy to the expense of fans and spectators. But worse, it's created a phenomenon which I would argue is almost exclusive to rugby. They've made the referee a more important figure than the players playing the game. Never has the phrase the man in the middle ever been truer than in rugby. I don't know any other sport where the announcement of who the referee is going to be garners as much media coverage. 
I've even been guilty of cradling a creamy pint of Guinness outside some South Dublin pub talking about how Roman Poit was going to focus on the scrum today. Madness, really. We've unintentionally created rugby superstars out of our referees. No offence intended to Nigel Owens, whom I enjoyed immensely during his officiating days, but there were times when something he said to a player on the pitch was the most memorable thing from the game. The echoes of Christopher still haunt my mind. You know what that punt means. It's skip pass, the part of the week where we huddle in the changing room at half time, take a breather and try to get our heads right before running back out to the pitch for the win. This week we're going to look at the other refereeing technologies like our TMO and see if there's anything rugby can steal with pride. The obvious starting point for us is with soccer's new video assistant referee or VAR system. Implemented only in the last 4 or 5 years, VAR's introduction has been met with much consternation. This is where FIFA could have actually learned a lot from rugby. When it was first introduced, it was done so without any appreciation for the game as it was. It was an inhuman robot which ruled objectively on four key areas. Goals plus offences leading up to goals, penalty decisions and offences leading up to penalties, red card offences and cases of mistaken identity. The challenge for soccer here is that you're making potentially game-changing decisions without any discussion. It's all very black or white. On the other hand, rugby's TMO facilitates the conversation and the referee is left to make the final decision. To be fair, the TMO in rugby is one official, so it's much easier to be included in a two-way conversation with the referee. There's a lot more to VAR here than you might think. For example, during the FIFA World Cup in Russia in 2018, the VAR team consisted of one video assistant referee and three assistant video assistant referees, yeah, assistants to the assistant, In addition, you had four replay officers manning the video playback and one official from FIFA relaying the VAR graphics and decisions to the media. That's a lot of people just to tell me that the multi-millionaire striker dived to get a penalty. It's a little over the top. Simplifying here might make the whole system go down a bit better with the fans. Anyway, I'm calling it Rugby 1, Soccer 0. Okay, so Soccer's VAR system has some catching up to do. But Cricket's Decision Review System, or DRS, is interesting because it measures a few additional elements than just TV replays. It uses the hotspot infrared system to map the heat signature of the cricket ball touching the bat or pad. This could be extremely useful in close quarter rugby situations like judging whether a ball had been grounded over the line, for example. Then there's the other applications of the Hawkeye system which are used in both tennis and in Irish Gaelic games. I'm talking about ball watching specifically here. In tennis, the Hawkeye system is used to judge whether the ball is in or out, awarding or penalising the player who hit the ball. In Ireland's Gaelic football and hurling, the Hawkeye system is similarly used to judge whether a ball has sufficiently gone over the bar between the goals. Especially useful in hurling when the ball, called the slitter, is no larger than a tennis ball and can be hard to see at the speed it travels. Rugby could opt to borrow from these sports and extend the use of Hawkeye to ensure penalty kicks and drop goals go over the posts and to checking the bouncing of the ball in field before going out for a line-out. But it shouldn't. Well, that's my opinion. Some of what makes rugby great is the 50-50 decisions that go for you some days and against you on other. That roll of the dice is what makes sports sport. And it shouldn't be eroded for the sake of accuracy down to one blade of grass or nostril hair offside. Now, now, it's all well and good us saying that the 50-50 decisions are a welcome addition and in the same breath give out about referees being the centre of attention on occasion. But on the balance of it, I doubt the referees overly enjoy it. As long as referees have stood in the middle of two opposing teams, there have been arguments and abuses hurled at them. Social media has only stood to accentuate the issue. It was only a year ago or so that Irish referee Andrew Brace was the victim of some malicious comments following a tribute he paid to his late father. This came in the aftermath of an England-France game where he had a particularly bad day at the office. The messages he received from some horrid members of the public contained words you wouldn't even speak to the milkman who bore your child and ran off with your wife. Deemed so bad by World Rugby's refereeing body that they stood braced down from a subsequent Champions Cup fixture. More recently, we have seen the 2021 British and Irish Lions Tour thrown into utter disarray with a leaked video review of the first test between the Lions in South Africa. 
The hour-long video rant shows Springbok Director of Rugby Razi Erasmus analysed 26 different incidents from the first test, scrutinising the officiating by Australian referee Nick Berry. The video itself was a disgrace. Calling out a referee like that in public is uncalled for. But worse yet was the second test, which was a sham of a game. The first half alone took longer than Razi's video, so terrified were the officials to make a decision. Ultimately, as sports people, we should know not to leave it down to the ref to decide the outcome of a game. And so it is. The laws make rugby unique from other sports and the changes made to them since professionalism have served to produce a better product. No, really, they have. Stats powerhouse Opta have kept stats in each Rugby World Cup, which offer us a great insight into how the game has changed along with the laws. For instance, there are 50% less scrums and 45% less lineouts combined with three times more rucks and tackles, all contributing to an increased ball and play time from 28 minutes per game in 1987 to 35 minutes per game in 2019. If I could change any law myself, I'd probably look at the ball being put into the scrum by the scrum half, or the growing plague of non captaining players complaining to the referee after decisions are made. But I think Exeter coach Rob Baxter put it best recently when he was asked the same question. The biggest thing rugby union needs to do is settle down. We will have a deeper understanding of the game if we leave it alone and don't change the laws every five minutes. And on that note, let's draw our show to an end. Thank you to all the listeners who've come back after the Christmas break and welcome again to the new listeners. We hope you'll stay with us in 2022 as we keep diving into the matters off the rugby pitch. We'll be back next week with the season one finale of The Rep, focusing on the British and Irish lines, another one of rugby's genius quirks. So until then... Don't forget to subscribe and if you can, rate us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify now to help us reach more listeners and grow the debate. Have a great 2022. Go well.